Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. This is a snippet from Kipling. As the creeper that girdles the tree trunk, the law runneth forward and back. For the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. I don't agree with Thomas Jefferson that we have rights that are self-evident or inalienable. I agree with Samuel Adams, who drafted the state constitution of Massachusetts, that the basis of rights is our covenanting with each other in community. Come, let's covenant. My name is Mary W. Maxwell. The W is from my maiden name, Waylon. I was born in Boston when the zip code was only two digits. Dorchester 24 Mass. I emigrated to Australia for marriage and have lived there for most of the last 38 years, except from 2005 to 2008, I was in the United States. My main interest is evolutionary biology, but I have a PhD in politics and am a law graduate of Adelaide University. I don't practice law, but I write books about it, such as Fraud Upon the Court and Prosecution for Treason. I love the US Constitution, and I'm a member of the Federalist Society in Washington, DC. In Australia, I've been involved in a case of a fellow who has been in jail for 21 years on completely false charges. It's easy to keep someone in jail indefinitely if you can prevent his having any communication with the outside world. The Australian guy, Martin Bryant, on the left, is not allowed to tell us what really happened and neither is Jokhar Tsarnaev. I'll pronounce his name Jahar instead of Jokhar, by your leave. Any American who is on death row gets an automatic appeal. Jahars will come up after July of this year, 2018. At that time, the three judges could reaffirm his conviction. Conceivably, they could overturn it, but I think it's more likely they will send it back to the federal district court for a retrial. Tonight, I'm going to play act the role of a defense attorney for Jahar. In Australia, I produced a moot court trial for Martin Bryant using only real documents from the prosecutor's file. Tonight, too, I will rely on the actual prosecution materials. Lucky I, luckily, I did not have to pay for the court transcripts. They're very expensive, but a Canadian, Jose Lapine, purchased them and has shared them, and with anyone she will share them. I want to emphasize that nothing I attempt here has any official status, of course. I want to expose the weaknesses of the actual trial of Mr. Tsarnaev, and having only one hour to do that, I'll squeeze it into an opening statement and a closing statement as if I were the attorney in an imaginary, hypothetical retrial of this case. If you notice someone walking in late who might mistake me for the real deal, just whisper to them, fictitious. Bliss it is to be alive, and to be old is very heaven. I'm so grateful to the Watertown Library for this venue. Someone wrote to the Watertown News to say that a library should not be used for conspiracy theory. There won't be any conspiracy theory in my talk alas, but I think a lib is suitable for that too. Around seven o'clock we will have open mic. Audience members can contribute facts or theories from their own store of knowledge. But please let me lecture interrupted as this show is being broadcast to an educational audience by Humuk. As putative defender of Yahar Sanayev, I've only got time tonight to give my client's side. You'll have to just imagine that you have heard the prosecution's side of the case. As you know, the charges against Jahar are mainly for, up there you have the bombing that occurred at the marathon, which involved three deaths and many injuries, the carjacking and kidnapping of Dun Meng, killing a member of the MIT campus police, and throwing explosives at police in Watertown. Now, here are 20 points that were put forth by the prosecution. Johar Tsarnaev was near the marathon finish line on Monday, April 15th, 2013, with a backpack. He carried a pressure cooker purchased by his brother Tamerlan containing explosives. 
He laid a backpack down near a tree in front of the Forum restaurant at 755 Boylston Street. Using a cell phone, he detonated a bomb at 2.50 p.m., 13 seconds after the first bomb went off. He walked away, and his brother Tamerlan also left the scene. At 3.12 p.m., Johar purchased milk at Whole Foods Grocery in Cambridge. Thursday at 5 p.m., FBI released photos of two suspects to the media, which caused the brothers to flee. Johar had a gun, but he and Tamerlan went to the MIT campus to steal a second gun. Going to Officer Sean Collier's car, they murdered him at 10.23 p.m., but did not get his gun. The brothers drove their Honda to Brighton Avenue in Alston and carjacked a Mercedes SUV. Johar participated in the crime of kidnapping the driver, Dung Meng. During the ride, the brothers asked Dung Meng if the rented SUV could be taken out of state. They stopped at an ATM where Johar pilfered $800 from Dung Meng's bank account. Then they stopped at a Shell gas station, at which point Meng ran to the nearby mobile station. They went to Laurel Street, Watertown, and threw explosives and shot at police, close up. As a result, Officer Dick Donahue was wounded by a gunshot. Johar escaped by jumping into Meng's SUV and accidentally ran over his brother. Tamerlan arrived at hospital with gunshot wounds, as we see on the death certificate. Johar wrote a religious-sounding confession on the wall of a boat where he was hiding. In hospital, Johar admitted to interrogators who ordinarily handled high-value Guantanamo prisoners that he bombed the marathon. As all Americans should know, an accused person has a right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Imagine for a moment that you have been accused of stealing a diamond necklace from a shop. You know you didn't do it, so you phone a lawyer. She must do whatever she can to show that it wasn't you who stole the necklace. She needn't make any effort at all to discover who the real thief is. It's her duty to point out the inadequacy or unacceptability of any evidence that the prosecution presents. If Jihad does get a retrial, it's uncertain whether the government, that is the prosecution, would submit those very same 20 points that were listed. But I'm going to assume they will. So let me now step into my role, my imaginary role, as defensive attorney for Jihad in a fresh new trial. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, not one word of the prosecutor's case is true. None of the 20 accusations just recited accords with reality, except the one about Jahar buying milk. Neither my client nor his brother purchased any pressure cookers or placed any bombs on Boylston Street. They did not visit MIT on April 18th, did not kill Officer Sean Collier, did not carjack or kidnap Dun Meng, did not take money from Meng's bank account, did not shoot at cops or throw explosives in Watertown. In regard to the much publicized shootout on Laurel Street, it must have been someone else, not the Tsarnev brothers. Jaha did not run over his mother or escape from police at Laurel Street. He never wrote a confession on a boat and did not describe any terrorist activities to the Gitmo interrogators at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. We could start with the prosecution's evidence for the backpack, which the FBI says contained the bomb that did the damage at the finish line on April 15, 2013. This photo is the government's exhibit. This backpack is definitely black, but the evidence the prosecution gives for Jahar's presence at the marathon is the photo of him wearing a silver or whitish gray backpack. They do not submit any photo of Jahar wearing or carrying a black or dark backpack. And, oops, oh, there it is. 
That's enough to close this criminal trial without further ado. If it is true that this black item contained the bomb, as the FBI insists, the defendant may as well go home now, and police can restart their search. Jurors, since you are citizens of Massachusetts, it's very likely that you saw on TV a docudrama produced by National Geographic. One part of it is called White Hat. It got saturation coverage before the trial. It is deceitful. It attempts by subterfuge to make us viewers think that we have seen actual real life footage of someone placing a backpack at the site of the marathon when what we are actually watching is a reenactment. Recall the suggestive making of a cell phone call as if the boy were coordinating the bombing. You could be forgiven for thinking it's Jahar, but it is Alexander Caravay, an actor playing the role of Jahar. Just look at the credits of the National Geographic film. A man named Bob Robinson played David Henneberry, who found Jahar in the boat. Caravay played Jahar, and so forth. Caravay was born in 1991, Jahar in 1993. What you saw was a reenactment of people on Boylston Street, although the scene was actually filmed in Phoenix, Arizona. A docudrama is a legitimate form of media. Making a film using actors is not the problem here. However, there was a second reenactment within the film, sort of an overlay on the first one. In the White Hat video, we saw straightforward interviews with well-known men such as Governor Deval Patrick and the FBI chief, Richard Delorier. They're not acting. But we also see actors standing in an office looking at the street reenactment, looking at Jahar, so to speak. Almost any viewer would deduce that those actors who are playing the part of police or FBI are reviewing the real footage taken at the marathon. It is of grainy quality. Notice the pixelation. But that film didn't come from surveillance cameras or from the camera of a tourist at the marathon. It was freshly filmed in Phoenix, Arizona for National Geographic, its grainy quality notwithstanding. As for the false impression we get from the scene in the office, it's reinforced by a misleading statement posted at the beginning of the film. Video surveillance evidence from the marathon provides the FBI with a lead, a suspect laying a backpack at the scene wearing a white hat. A full year before the National Geographic movie came out, which was in 2014, we had media reporting that there's a video that tells all an article published by TheBlaze.com had the headline, Chilling Video Shows Bombing Suspect Drop His Bag and Take Cover. The article says, I quote, Speaking on Meet the Press, the governor said surveillance video from the attack shows one suspect dropping his backpack and calmly walking away before the bomb inside exploded. It clearly puts 19 year, still, still quoting the governor, it clearly puts 19 year old Joka Tsarnaev at the scene of the attack, he added. And now quoting the governor directly, it does seem to be pretty clear that this suspect took the backpack off, put it down, did not react when the first explosion went off, and then moved away from the backpack in time for the second explosion. Governor Patrick remarked, it's pretty clear about his involvement. The article in The Blaze continues, Governor Patrick said he hadn't actually viewed the videotape, but had been briefed by law enforcement officials about it. Yeah. Jurors, if that video actually exists, the prosecution will of course exhibit it to you. If the prosecution only refers to it, you must not count that as evidence. I say there is no video of any identifiable person dropping a backpack. The prosecution did show you a video of a person in the crowd, but you can't identify Jaha from that. In regard to each of the crimes with which the defendant is charged, 
I will show you that the prosecution's evidence is so thin that you could not possibly find the defendant guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Jahar isn't the demon that the media incessantly talk about. He's just a normal college kid, happy to be a US citizen. He has had no motive to hurt Boston. I repeat, Jahar had no motive to bomb the marathon. This case lacks a motive. At 6 p.m. on Friday, April 19th, 2013, the city's lockdown was lifted and then Jahar was found in a dry docked boat. The police shot 228 bullets at the boat. Then he was taken to the hospital. According to a U.S. defense report, the patient had, I quote, life-threatening gunshot wounds to his head, mouth, pharynx, face, jaw, throat, left hand, and both legs. Also, his scapula was shattered. Damage to cranial nerves required that his left eye be sutured closed and his jaw was wired shut. You know that Jahar was unarmed. Supposedly, Jahar spoke to the Gitmo interrogators, assuring them that he had no other accomplices, so they knew Boston was safe. But there's no recording of his saying that or of his writing anything in hospital. It's the same with all FBI interviews. The individual remarks are never recorded electronically, and the person is not given a type statement to sign to agree that it contains what he actually said to the investigator. The FBI uses a Form 302 in which the agent describes what she thinks the person said. This may violate the Fifth Amendment protection against self-incrimination. Jurors, I will oppose every flimsy item of evidence from the prosecution, as well as misleading evidence. There will be three weeks of witness testimony, examination of physical evidence, and expert opinion. But now I have to go straight to my summing up. So you missed those three weeks. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I sum up this retrial by emphasizing that Jahar Tsanayev pleads not guilty for three weeks now, you've seen me demolish every statement that incriminates my client. You've seen me cross-examine witnesses and challenge the prosecutor's exhibits one by one. I've shown exculpatory evidence that justifies an acquittal. You must return a verdict of not guilty for each of the 30 charges. They are unsubstantiated and unproven. In this closing statement, I'm going to repeat my three primary arguments, which were that A, the prosecutor's evidence is of poor quality, B, Jahar's alleged confessions are illogical, and C, the many pieces of exculpatory evidence are more than enough to exonerate Jahar. Argument A, poor quality of prosecution evidence. Here are three examples. One, a glaring piece of poor evidence is the receipt for a purchase of five pressure cookers at Saugus Mall in January. Three months later, this receipt turns up in Tamerlan's wallet on the night of his allegedly fleeing from the law. There is no name on the receipt. It was bought with cash. Please note, it does not constitute evidence that Tamerlan bought a pressure cooker. So we ask, does Saugus Mall have CCTV for surveillance? How does the prosecution claim to know that Tamerlan went to Saugus? They don't know that he went to Saugus. Their evidence is a GPS showing that someone made a trip from Cambridge to Saugus, but they cannot tie the GPS data to Tamerlan. Anyway, the prosecution's claim is embarrassing. What criminal would buy a weapon and retain the receipt for three months? And it is self-evident that a person committing a crime would be highly unlikely to carry evidence of his guilt in his pocket. Example two, about the alleged documentary proof of Tsarnev's presence at Laurel Street shootout. There is none. Only one Watertown resident, Andrew Kitzenberg, took pictures from an upper story window. This is the quality of proof on which you were to identify the criminal. Note the ease with which jurors found Jahar guilty of throwing pipe bombs. And for all 30 charges against him, there's a 
verdict thing like this, and 12 jurors, so 12 times 30, 360 times there was always a tick in the box of guilty. No one even brought in a not guilty on some minor point. Okay. Another important point to note is that police cars nowadays have dash cams. If there is any dash cam evidence, it has been suppressed. The legal principle here is omnia presumuntur contra spoliatorum. Against the one who despoils or hides evidence, all things can be presumed. I also ask you to question whether two fugitives would flagrantly march up to the headlights of a cop car surely inviting capture or death. According to the prosecution, the brothers shared only one gun. That's according to the prosecution. How would they be able to challenge several well-trained cops? Example three of poor quality evidence. Jahar is charged with the killing of MIT police officer Sean Collier. That allegation comes from two citizens. Dan Meng claimed that Tamerlan boasted to him that he had just killed a cop. And an MIT student, Nathan Harmon, says he rode his bike past the scene of the murder around 10.20 p.m. and saw a man whom he identified in the courtroom as Jahar, leaning into Officer Collier's cruise car. Nathan did not say, nor did the prosecutor ask him to say, that he heard the noise of a gunshot or saw the young man do anything. Jurors, as I said, we have only the word of Dun Meng that Tamerlan killed a police officer and only the testimony of the bike rider that he saw a man at the car. What does the prosecutor offer us in support of their testimony? Nothing but a video from a distant camera of two men walking purposefully from a parking lot to the very spot where Sean Collier's cruiser was parked at MIT to steal a gun. Here, I hope you can see a video. In the, in the circle are the two boys, two girls do something, and they walk as if you could possibly see their face or even their body shape. They walk, 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 until they get around the corner towards that red car. It's not red, but it's the headlights. So then they, they quit and immediately they go back and they disappear. That's the, that's the evidence that Jahar and Tamerlan have murdered a man whom they had nothing to do with and whose the alleged motive was to steal his gun. It's hard to make out much from the surveillance video, but MIT graduate student Nathan Harmon, captured on tape riding his bike that night, says he's certain who he saw. It is impossible to see if the two persons in the video are young or old or even male or female, there is no proof whatsoever that they are the Sarnevs. Mr. Isko of MIT testified that the campus operates some 1,200 surveillance cameras. Here he is receiving the Unsung Heroes Award. It says, Matt Isko has designed, well, you, you can read it. Okay. Surely MIT has better footage of the area where Collier was killed. So did the prosecution subpoena a closer photo? Consider the Brady Rule from a 1963 U.S. Supreme Court decision. If the prosecution has better footage, it must not suppress it. It must hand over any and all exculpatory evidence in its possession. That means evidence in Jahar's favor is part of our Sixth Amendment right to due process. And why should government hold it back? The chief of the MIT cops, Sergeant Clarence Henniger, said he drove by Collier's car very near the time of the alleged shooting, and he did not see anyone or hear gunfire or voices. Another problem of ed evidence integrity is that Collier's car was destroyed soon after, and no reason has been given. Recall omnia presumuntur 
contra spoliatorum. You can declare everything against the party who spoils or hides evidence. Even without that maxim, destroying evidence is a felony under the heading obstruction of justice. Indeed, some of Jahar's friends, several of them, I believe, were rounded up and convicted of that crime of destroying evidence. <coughs> Thus, they've been in prison since 2014 and hence are unavailable to tell us whatever they might wish to say. The most irregular and suspect thing about the evidence of the killing of Sean Collier is that the prosecution presented a one-hour compilation video of the MIT event that inexplicably omitted the moment of the murder. That omitting means the video is misleading. Misleading evidence exculpates the defendant. Of course. This is my argument B. First was thin evidence, and this has to do with illogical confessions. The first was made to Dunming. The second one was written on a boat wall, and finally one was given after Jahar was sentenced to death at age 22. The first one, Dun Meng's story of what was said to him by Tamerlan is odd. Tamerlan had confessed, or boasted actually, that he was both the marathon bomber and had just killed a cop. It's abnormal for a fleeing criminal to make a confession to a stranger. What could he gain by it? A criminal's standard impulse is to conceal his role in a crime, not advertise it. Although I remind you that Dun Meng's testimony is suspect, he changed his story about what happened over time, and that's the classic sign of an unreliable witness. Meng first gave his report to police when they rescued him from that mobile station after 11 p.m. on April 18th. That was the Thursday after the Monday Marathon. In court, he just testified on day 32 of the 2015 jury trial in response to a question by prosecution attorney, Mr. Mellon. Meng said, after that, he asked me, do you know, do you know the Boston Marathon explosion? I said, yes, I know. And then he asked, do you know who did it? I said, no, I don't. He said, I did it. And I just killed a policeman in Cambridge. On Friday, April 19th, the Associated Press reported Watertown Police Chief Ed DeVoe as saying that Tamerlan admitted both of his crimes, the marathon bombing and the cop killing, to Dun Meng. On Saturday, April 20th, the New York Times told the story differently. They did not mention the alleged stop at a gas station where Meng escaped. Rather, the Times said, and I quote here, the suspects decided not to kill the owner of a sports utility vehicle that had been carjacked and instead threw him out of his car around 1 a.m., unquote. What was the New York Times source for this, you will want to know? They said only that it came from a senior law official. On Sunday, April 21, Officer Daniel Genk filed the official criminal complaint, which includes Tamerlan's confession of the bombing and the theft from an ATM, but not the killing of a policeman. This suggests that the killing of a policeman was added in later. On Monday, April 22nd, Meng gave an interview to Radio WMUR in New Hampshire, disguising his name as Danny. Nick Spinetto, the interviewer, asked questions. Meng said that Tamerlan told him he had done the marathon bombing, but he didn't mention the killing of Collier. In sum, Tamerlan Sarnev's confession to Dun Meng lacks probative value. A second illogical confession is the one Jahar allegedly wrote on the wall of the boat. If he's in hiding, afraid of the law, why write a confession? Conversely, if the fugitive feels moved to confess, why not just turn himself in? How long was he expecting to last on the boat without food or water? Also note that no handwriting analysis was done to see if it was in fact Jahar's. Do you recall the pencil found on the boat, identified as the writing instrument? It looks unused, pristine. 
And why did the authorities take three weeks to announce that a confession had been found on the vote wall? In short, jurors, you should discount the vote confession, both on the basis of its illogical nature and the lack of any proof Jahar wrote it. And recall that the subject matter of the confession is both religious, praising Allah, and political, saying revenge is appropriate for the US's harming of Muslims. No one had ever heard Jahar talking in that vein. And there is no evidence, none, that he was ever radicalized. Again, this case has no motive. There's another good reason for you to discredit the boat wall confession. Namely, it mentions that Tamerlan had died. According to the prosecution's story of my client running over his brother with an automobile and then escaping, Jahar would have had no way of knowing whether Tamerlan was dead or alive. Conclusion, the boat wall confession is not authentic. Further point, if somebody planted fake evidence on the boat, that would obviously be exculpatory for Jahar and is a serious crime. I'll say it once more, the boat wall confession is not credible. The third confession was made publicly in the courtroom. You may think Jahar expressed remorse in order to get a reduced sentence. And by the way, that's what I thought when I heard that he had you know, said, I'm so sorry, I hurt many people. No, he had by then received the jury's decision, execution. False confessions are well known. A mafia member may take the fall if someone threatens to harm his family to save them from being hurt. I am now going to tell you something shocking. The court has on file an affidavit from Jahar's paternal aunt, Marit Tsarneva, dated May 17, 2015. She reports that attorneys on the defense team had traveled to Russia numerous times to pressure Jahar's parents, Anzor and Zubidat. Marit is a lawyer. She swore under penalty of perjury. The lawyers from Boston strongly advised that Anzor and Zubidat refrain from saying in public that Jokar and his brother Tamerlan were not guilty. Hello. They warned that if their advice were not followed, Jokar's life in custody near Boston would be more difficult. He was incarcerated at Fort Devens at the time. As I was saying, some prisoners confess as a way to help their family. There is another crucial point in Marit's affidavit, namely she referred to a report by her sister Malkin in Russia. Malkin said, in 2014 in Grozny, Charlene, the independent investigator, stated flatly that her employer, the Federal Public Defender's Office in Boston, knew that Joha was not guilty as charged and that their office was under enormous pressure from law enforcement agencies and high levels of the government not to resist conviction. Charlene could, of course, be subpoenaed to testify about that. Interruption. I said I would now review the third thing, the A, the B, and the C, was to be exculpatory evidence. But running out of time, I'll, because I want you, please, to say what you want at a sort of open mic right after this. So to make time for that, I'm going to, um, skip the third part because you already heard me say exculpatory and instead I want to tell you that a friend of mine who's very educated emailed me some questions last night knowing about this talk and he wants me to answer them. I was amazed at the questions. He said, Dear Mary, you write they did not visit MIT on April 18th. How do you know that? Although they cannot be identified by the MIT surveillance footage known to the public, how do we know they were not on the campus? There are two questions there. How do I, Jahar's attorney, fictitious, know it? I know it because he told me. In real life, I'm not his attorney and have never met him, but normally one listens to one's client. And if he says he is innocent, one brings that to court. For reasons unknown, Judy Clark, as his public defender, did not say Jahar was innocent. 
in her opening statement, she actually said, it was him. And she wrote to the judge asking him not to say in his instructions to the jury that he had pleaded not guilty. I find that incredible. But it was the same for Martin Bryant in Australia, only worse. His defense lawyer told him he could never see his mother again if he did not plead guilty. And as I mentioned, he's been in the clink for 21 years now. The other half of my friend's question was, how can the public know the brothers weren't on the MIT campus? Well, how does the world know that I was not in Tiffany's on North Terrace, Adelaide when that diamond necklace was stolen? I don't have to show that I wasn't there. Possibly I would have an alibi. 20 people saw me in Sydney that day at my son's wedding. That should win the case. But why have we forgotten our basic law? When did Americans adopt the ridiculous belief that once a person has been nominated by the media as a baddie, only some miracle can get him acquitted? No. Here, here's the next question question my friend emailed to me. He said, you say he did not carjack or kidnap Dun Meng. How did Dun Meng get into that vehicle? I think my friend is confused because it was Dun Meng's vehicle used in it. But look, my client, Jahar, does not have to explain anything about Dun Meng. My side rejects the whole claim that the brothers did a carjacking. In America, you are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Granted, Jahar did get proven guilty. The 12 jurors decided to go with the Dunmang story. But note that Judy Clark had not cross-examined Dunmang. For instance, didn't ask him why that story changed three times. She also let Nathan Harmon go without cross-examination. Recall that I emphasized in this putative retrial the Tamerlanes confessing to Dunmeng is illogical, but I could have emphasized the illogicality of doing a carjacking at all. They had a Honda. They went to pick up an additional vehicle. What a nuisance to have a kidnappee riding around with you. The Martin Bryant case in Australia also has an unnecessary carjacking. Pardon me, I'll get back to the job now. That was an aside. Finally, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my client, the accused Jahar Zanayev, is innocent, and on top of that, is bereaved of his brother. He has been in solitary confinement for five years. He is regarded the world over as a terrorist, yet there is no case against him. There were many injuries, amputations, and three deaths at the marathon. But my client had nothing to do with that. When you go to the jury room, you may feel scared about all this. It is scary. Liars may seem formidable, but think of it this way. Lying is never a sign of strength. Rather, it's an indicator of weakness and fear. You have strength because you have the law to work with. The law of innocence until proven guilty. It's not a modern invention. It 800 years old, thanks to the Magna Carta. Dear audience in this library, that's the end of my pretending to be in court defending Jaha. You can find an exact transcript of this lecture at the website 911tv.org and also at the website that I write for in Australia, gumshoenews.com. I can think of three ways that Massachusetts could deal with this. I have only been treating, of course, the case is a federal case. There's no Massachusetts in it. But the sovereign state of Massachusetts could reclaim the night, as it were. In fact, it's, I believe it, there's no federal role to play in these crimes. It should have been from the state. So I'm going to suggest three ways that Massachusetts could get in on the business. I think it was said a year or more ago that the district attorney of Middlesex County, I think her name is Marion Ryan, would be the prosecutor of the 
just the Sean Collier death, but then that didn't happen either. So it was entirely federal. But here's three ways, even if it sounds like they're just wild tactics, and they are, but so what? Way to get them back. First, they could accuse Jahar of another crime, and I would recommend treason. Not that I think he is guilty of anything, never mind treason, but I like to see any episode of violence against the population be tried under the law of treason. And Massachusetts has a common law of treason. In 2004, Justice Scalia wrote in a dissent in the case of Hamdi that Jose Padilla should be treated as a traitor for threatening to blow up an apartment building in Chicago. Why not? Jaha would be able to talk to us in Boston at last if he would come in and be tried again. Secondly, he could file a civil action suing police for his injuries under the civil rights law, which says every person who causes any citizen to be subjected to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law or other proper proceeding for redress. That's in Title 42 of the US Code, Section 1983. Thirdly, on my YouTube video entitled, Massachusetts Governor, Please Arrest the FBI, I show how the National Guard, you laugh, but it's the law. It's the law. I show how the National Guard can be used, as well as local cops, to arrest the criminal Phoebes. And I show how a RICO case could easily be mounted against Homeland Security on the basis of its being a corrupt organization. That's why we have RICO, you know. I think truth commissions and citizen-led grand juries would also be the way to fill the bill. Remember this. Not too much happening in there that proves my client not guilty. Luckily, just last week, the US Supreme Court heard the case of McCoy versus Louisiana. Mr. McCoy insisted that he wanted to plead not guilty, but his public defender went ahead and pleaded guilty on his behalf. In Jahar's case, as I said, the defender asked the judge to omit, in his instruction to the jury, the standard words, the defendant has pleaded not guilty to all charges. The judge in Boston did indeed omit those words. Can you imagine? I've written to the Bureau of Prisons asking if Jahar could be given access for this live stream tonight. So if you're watching, Jahar, hello, compatriot, Canterbridgean, millennial. Are you aware that attorney Jack Graham has arranged for Amaki Curie to participate in the appeals stage? Or that Elena Thayer collected 7,000 signatures for you and sent it to the UN Human Rights Group. She's the ex-soldier who shouted in the courtroom, we support you. You just wait and see, bro. People are waking up. They've had it with the desecration of our Constitution. And Jaha, did you know that Cheryl Dean writes brilliantly about you and your plight at gumshoenews.com in Australia? That's a bit far away, but tonight I hope you will hear some locals speaking in this room. There's going to be an open mic. Finally, it's just Mary talking again. I say, dear visitors to Watertown Library, I thank you all for listening, and I thank Hamouk at the back of the room of 911tv.org for live streaming this, and also the Watertown Public Access Channel for recording it. I thank the many folks in the media who helped me publicize this hypothetical retrial. Fancy me thanking the media. Oh, what you did to Martin Bryant in Oz. Ooh. But all will be forgiven, media people, if you turn over a new leaf. I say, come, let's covenant. Let's take the rule of law out of the trash can. Precious, life-saving rule of law. And let's not believe the truth is something that 
went out of fashion. What arrant nonsense. Thank you. Everyone doesn't disagree with me. <laughs>